this evening uh, is an artist and a composer, um, and she works at the interface of social, political, and technological infrastructure. Um, she's going to talk to us about the potential of sound and how uh, we can how how it engages uh, with political questions. So please give a big round of applause to Jasmine Gofund. Thank you. It's um, can you hear me? Sorry. Oh yes. Now I can hear me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and. I'm very impressed looking at around at how many people are sitting and waiting to listen to a presentation on a Saturday evening. This is indeed a special congress. So hi, my name is Jasmine Gafond. I am an artist who works primarily with sound. I also make electronic music and today I will be talking about one project. It's called Listening Back. It's an add-on for the Firefox and Chrome browsers that translates cookies into sound while you browse online. Anyone can um, uh, get it, download it and install it um, via, for Firefox or via the Chrome store for the Chrome browser. And so the way that this works is that every time a cookie is inserted onto my computer or deleted from my computer or updated, a sound is triggered. And those sounds that you could hear just now were uh, Google cookies. And it's interesting to note that the Google Analytic cookie is actually the most uh, common cookie across the entire World Wide Web and our personal computers. So I'm just going to load another page. So that kind of stuttering sound that you just heard and that you'll be hearing again during this presentation is actually um, the limit, um, well, my um, system reaching its limit. And that's because browser add-ons were never intended to process large amounts of sound. So when I was... When I was in the development phase of this project, a lot of uh, some websites were crashing the browser due to the sheer amount of cookie activity um, generating sound at one time. So I had to set a cap on how many cookies could trigger sound at once. And it's currently set to 43. But um, it's interesting to note that the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the de facto standardization body for the Internet, has written a proposed standard for cookies. Um, and actually this is a really interesting document. It's more than just a technical document. It traces a five and a half year process in writing a standardization for a rapidly expanding tracking technology. And in it, they suggest that browsers should be able to host at least 50 cookies per domain and at least 3,000 cookies in total. Um, so that's a lot of cookies. And uh, cookies are actually just one of many different online tracking technologies that are implemented through the technical protocol of the World Wide Web. Our personal data is thereby captured, collected, aggregated, compiled, and sold. Such data can include our IP address, type of computer or mobile phone, operating system, the add-ons we have installed, our searches, our likes, the websites we visit, what we buy, what we watch, and how long our cursor lingers on a page. Some of the lesser Known online surveillance technologies include web bugs, audio beacons, web RTC, IP discovery, third-party HTTP requests, and device fingerprinting. 
The device fingerprinting method can be broken down into a further subset of tracking techniques, including canvas, browser, font, audio context and battery API fingerprinting. But when I started this project, I had only ever heard of cookies. Because our access to the World Wide Web is visually mediated through screen devices. The web browser, as an interface for the World Wide Web, marks a point where technology becomes apparent to the user. Online monitoring technologies such as cookies are largely obscured from the user, making these systems difficult to approach, analyse and understand. By sonifying this largely invisible tracking technology, so that is by transforming the data generated by cookies into sound, I'm interested in sound's ability to interrupt the visual surface and highlight a disconnect between the graphical interface of the World Wide Web and the socio-political implications of background algorithmic processes of data capture. So here, sound is functioning as a mediator of the invisible. By enabling the opportunity to listen back to otherwise imperceivable monitoring infrastructures, I ask, what is the potential of sound as a means for revealing asymmetrical relationships of power inherent to surveillance societies? And how does it feel to be routinely monitored? Uh, when I use the word feel, I'm interested in how our understanding of data is affected by experiencing it through sound. How does a potentially emotional and bodily experience of data influence our understanding? So sound is a method of knowledge and thinking, or to put it in another way, knowledge and understanding through sensing experience. I'd like to credit the programmer that I collaborated with for this project, Max Breeden and Brian McLeod, who further helped me with some modifications, and Tom McIntyre, who along with Brian helped me get it onto um, AMO or Mozilla for Firefox. So that actually just happened in the last couple of weeks, but it's been on the Chrome store for a little while. Um, Max suggested that we use the Tombra.js library uh, for designing the sounds. So that's the library I used for programming the sounds. And I'd assign specific signature sounds for some of the most um, commonly used or the largest uh, web platforms, such as Google, Facebook. Amazon, YouTube, and some of the third-party cookies that are, um, I found to be most commonly used across a lot of different websites, such as the one you can hear right now. Um, probably most of you know the difference between first and third-party cookies, because there are definitely some um, way nerdier, techier talks at this uh, Congress, but just in case. <laughs> A first party cookie is any cookie that has the domain name of the website you're on. So for example with theguardian.com, any cookie that has the domain name theguardian.com is a first party cookie and any cookie with any other domain name is a third party cookie and that's what you can hear right now. It's a third party cookie that's constantly updating on my computer uh, via the Guardian website. It's called krxd.net. Um, it's used for targeting and advertising across 5,926 different websites. Uh, persistent and session cookies are another subset of cookies where um, the session cookie is deleted from your computer when you close the browser or log out of a session or close the tab, um, whereas persistent cookies are there for as long as they've been programmed to be there for. 
unless of course you clear your cache. Um, and so this can be anything from uh, seconds to minutes to hours to days to months to weeks. Um, and here are the top 100 websites found using this cookie out of the 5,926. Uh, so if you're interested in doing cookie research, I can actually recommend uh, Cookiepedia as quite a thorough database. Now, as I mentioned before, a sound is triggered whenever a cookie is inserted, deleted or updated. But not every time a cookie is read by the browser or website. So the data I had access to for this project was determined by the browser's API. Uh, that is what information Google or Mozilla provide to third party developers. So in this case, case, it's every time a cookie is inserted, deleted or updated, but not when a cookie is read by the browser or web server. And what was insightful to me was the extent to which certain technical processes are hidden even from tech savvy programmers, because these processes of online data extraction are in fact well kept business secrets. Uh, Max, who I collaborated with, found a way to hack into the Chrome API and access the data for how often a cookie is read by the browser. But since there is already an extraordinary amount of cookie activity, just from each time a cookie is inserted, deleted or updated, I decided not to use the data for when a cookie is being read because I also knew I wanted to be able to make the listening back add-on available for anyone to download via the Chrome Store or Mozilla. Um, as it was important for me that anyone could have access to it if they desired. Now, this project has consequently directed my attention to the history of internet cookies themselves. And from within this recent historical framework surfaces a direct link between the invention of cookies in 1994 the origins of automated online data collection, the commercialization of the World Wide Web, and the emergence of contemporary modes of surveillance capitalism. So, um, surveillance capitalism is a term that's been... is a term that's been recently pop popularized by Shazana Zuboff uh, with a book that was published uh, at the beginning of this year, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And um, in brief, or extremely briefly, um, it refers to the online data broker industry as headed by corporations such as Google. In this big industry, in this industry, big data is a surveillance asset and profits are derived from a unilateral surveillance of users of online platforms in which the aim is to modify human behaviour, predict and control markets, which I think uh, most of us are familiar with by now. Um, and this image, which I love, I should credit, uh, comes from uh, Internet of Shit's uh, Twitter feed. So if you happen to be on Twitter, I can recommend following Internet of Shit because he's not only hilarious but very poignant. Um, and so another important condition to this culture of surveillance capitalism is the agency of technology to monitor in real time, which provides an unprecedented, extraordinary infrastructure for radically distributed opportunities for observation, interpretation, communication, influence, prediction, and ultimately control. Now I believe that the technical and commercial origins of the online data broker industry lie with the invention of the cookie in 1994. And at this time, the World Wide Web was a stateless infrastructure. So stateless is a computer engineering term used to describe the situation in which Every time a website is visited, there is absolutely no recall of previous visits, preferences, login information, or user ID. 
Without a state mechanism to store records of browsing activity, online shopping as we know it today would not have been possible. And this is actually a very important point because this is where it all begins. So of course advertisers were tracking customers before the web, um, but this is the origins of online um, tracking uh, and automated tracking. So online shopping before cookies would have been analogous to using a vending machine as you could only buy one product at a time and there would have been no automated feature to remember your personal information. So a stateless web meant that every visit to a website was like the first and any commercial transaction would have to be handled from start to finish in just one single session. Presented with this online condition of memory loss, Netscape communications programmer Lou Montui developed a state mechanism while working on an uh, e-commerce um, application for uh, a North American telecom giant MCI. Um, the seven million dollar contract was for a new shopping cart application for online stores. Uh, developed together with John Giannandria over a six month period. So remember the standardization process took five and a half years whereas the development of the cookie itself was only six months. Uh, Montui named this state mechanism a cookie after a Unix protocol already in use called Magic Cookie. And incidentally, there are various origin stories going around about the name Magic Cookie. Uh, probably the most famous one is that it was invented by coders in San Francisco who were working late into the night, as you do. And so they um, ordered in food from Chinatown and with that came a fortune cookie and apparently that's the namesake for the Magic Cookie. But most of these stories have been debunked but I did manage to trace it back to a 1979 Unix programmer's manual. Um, and a magic cookie functions as an opaque identifier that is sent back and forth between different pieces of software unchanged. So I still don't know why it's called a magic cookie. And if anyone has any information about that, I would love to know. So similar to the magic cookie, the internet cookie is defined by its invisibility. So remember the magic cookie is an opaque identifier and the internet cookie or HTML cookie is a small reference file that is sent by a web server to a browser and then placed by the browser on the user's computer. And every time the user loads the website, for example, the browser sends the cookie back to the server to notify the website. So a cookie is like a reference number or ID that travels between web servers, web browsers and our personal computers. The internet cookie allows web servers to identify users without disclosing what and how much information is being collected. Its content is therefore at the discretion of the web server. Inherent to the technical protocol of a cookie is a lack of transparency that aligns knowledge and power in the hands of their creator. And importantly, the cookie provided a means to reliably implement a virtual shopping cart. So cookies literally gave birth to the virtual shopping cart. And significantly for the first time, a protocol for online automated data collection. Uh, technically termed persistent client state object and Lou Montui patented it as such. That's a Google cookie, by the way. Um, so as you can see, inventor Lou Montui, um, current assignee Facebook. Uh, cookies transformed the World Wide Web from a system of discontinuous visits to a culture of persistent connectivity. 
Version 0.9 beta of Mosaic Netscape was released on October 13th, 1994 and supported state management. This was followed by the commercial release of the Netscape Navigator browser in 1995, which introduced cookies silently as a default setting. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I do remember the Netscape Navigator browser. Um, and someone's put together this video. Uh. <laughs> for it means the longer it's been programmed to be on your computer. Um, so it wasn't until 1996 that the privacy implications of cookies first became known to the public. And I should note here, this was very much due to the standardization process because uh, they were raising concerns about the privacy implications, particularly of third party cookies. And this led to some newspaper articles such as the San Jose Mercury News headline, Web Cookies May Be Spying On You. The extraction of user-generated data in exchange for advertising revenue has subsequently developed into a business model key to the sustainability of internet platforms. By sonifying a largely invisible tracking technology, the Listening Back plugin critiques a lack of transparency inherent to online monitoring technologies and the broader context of opt-in default cultures intrinsic to contemporary modes of online connectivity. Um, so what I mean by a default culture is, for example, uh, with the browser, you either get it with your operating system or perhaps you download it from the web and the first time you use it, you are by default opted in to being tracked by third-party cookies but uh, every browser offers the option to block third-party cookies, and this in no way affects the functionality of the World Wide Web, but I found that not many people know about it, and also it's um, hidden down in a lot of sub-menus. Uh, so for example, with the Chrome browser, you have to go to Settings, and then scroll down to Advanced, and then under privacy and security, it's in site settings, and then cookies and site data, and here you can block third party cookies. It states that some sites may not work properly, but I've never, ever, ever had a problem um, by blocking third party cookies. So you can hear how a lot of the ongoing sound is third party cookies, uh, typically, most third-party cookies are there when you load a page. And um, this is not always the case, but often, and the third-party cookies are usually the regular ones. Um, so I thought it was important uh, to be able to listen to the web um, and hear the difference between third and third-party cookies. So there is a... Um, interface for this plugin and um, you can change the scale if you like um, and then you can turn third party cookies um, up and down so if you wanted to listen to the web without third party cookies um, you can turn it down and vice versa so it's not blocking the cookies, it's just um, turning down the volume of the sound. And then here you can enter the domain name um, for a cookie and um, turn it up and down or change the octave. So I could put it up a couple of octaves. So I've used it for live performance and um, installation. Uh, how am I doing for time? Yeah, um, I can show you another couple of um, sites uh, because another other sites that use a lot of cookies are actually flight 
uh, search engines. So, actually, I might even close the Guardian. Um, so, I made a special sound for Expedia. Which actually also has that same third party cookie. I just turn it down for now. And this one's quite fun to play around with the, um, the octave. And then what if. This project asks, what is the potential of a sound, of sound as a tool for transparent questioning? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jasmine, for a very entertaining talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. If you have any questions, we have three microphones here in each one of the aisles. Um, so feel free to approach and ask a question. Um, microphone number one. Thank you. Thank you for nice tunes. I have a question. How you composed and decided on which pitch will be for which website and what cookie will sound how? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, in a way, a lot of it was sort of intuitive because I do work a lot um, with electronic sound and music and so I just made sounds that I liked. But another deciding factor was, say for this generic cookie sound, um, because the cookie activity is so constant, I wanted to make a sound that you didn't find too annoying and therefore turn it off immediately, because I think it's important to sort of engage with it for a while. So it's trying to find a balance between, um, yeah, it's just to find a sound that you can listen to. Um, over and over um, and then it was uh, I just it just made sense to make um, individual sounds for the main platforms because I knew everybody would be going to those platforms and I guess for the Amazon one I did kind of try and make it a bit more scary than usual um, <laughs> especially because uh, I've performed this sometimes you know on a PA system in a club with a subwoofer and then there's a lot of bass in that sound that's quite uh, overwhelming and uh, I guess the decision with um, I, I chose like four keys that work together so you know no matter what key you put it in it'll still be in tune except for that generic cookie sound which um, you can't tune because I find if you're listening to a lot of different data, it helps if it's in tune. Otherwise, it can be really confusing to try and uh, work out what sound belongs to what data. Um, so no matter what you do, you're not going to. It's not going to. It's sort of going to be tuneful. Yeah. Microphone number two. Um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, as you mentioned, there are lots of other forms of tracking techniques that can go on on a web page. Um, for example, JavaScript fingerprinting. Do you have any plans to roll out different and you know, increasingly creative sounds for those kinds of practices? Um, I think that would be a great idea, actually, to sort of, um, you'd have to, to, to add all the different tracking technologies. I mean, I think you'd have to have an interface where you could turn them off. like. The individual data sets because otherwise it would just be way too much sound um, which might be nice at, for a moment but then if you want to sort of try and listen to how much say web beacons are present or device fingerprinting or, 
Um, yeah, I don't have any actual plans, and if anyone wants to collaborate, I'd be happy uh, to collaborate. But um, yeah, I have thought about it, and I think that would be a nice idea. Number three. Um, yes, so thanks for the talk, it was great. Um, I have a question that is related to the first one you got. Did you like explore trying to use some of like the randomness that is in these cookies to make the sounds more unique? The what? So, so like all of these cookies contain a lot of like junk, basically, that is like unique to each person. Junk? Well, data, I guess. Uh -huh. um, did you try, using, try to use any of that to like generate the more unique sounds? Um, well, the data that I have access to, I mean, I can show you, uh, I think, so this background page um, uh, shows you in a way what data I have access to. Um, and so override is when it's updating um, or it's inserted or deleted. I actually focused... Um, so far on the different domain names as um, for creating sounds and also then uh, the length that a cookie um, is programmed to be on your computer that also affects the length of the sound but um, Max who I worked with was said that it couldn't be longer than a couple of seconds just because of the CPU and um, like I was saying the browser add-ons not really meant for um, processing a lot of sound but there's a lot of other information that you could sonify, um, such as the date and time, or um, if it's a session cookie or a persistent cookie. Um, as you can see, it's really hard to know what, I don't know how well you can see it, it's really hard to decipher actually what a cookie is doing, which is part of this sort of lack of transparency. So even if you have access to this background page, which I guess we all do have access to, when you look at the ver val, I mean, it's impossible to understand what it means. Or I find it impossible to understand what it means. So this junk or noise that you're talking about, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Or if I would have access to it via the API. I was, I was thinking like just using, for example, the var bell here. The what? The like the value of the barbell. Oh, okay, have here. Okay. So like ignoring whatever it's supposed to mean, mean but and just, just using it, a, using it to generate a yeah, sound. Yeah, basically. Oh yeah, yeah. That's something you could do, and then it would be more individual every sound. Yeah, that's a good idea. Microphone number two. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this beautiful talk. I was wondering, do you have a favorite musically speaking website? A favorite musically speaking so, website. So yeah, so like a website which for, gives uh, very for nice myself sound or, or just generally music. So with your plugin, when yeah. you go to that website, it makes some beautiful sound. Oh, okay. I do quite like Expedia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Number one. Okay. Um, I have maybe two questions or a suggestion and a question. The first is. I'd find it very interesting to make something similar which doesn't um, display or doesn't um, audioize uh, third-party cookies, but third-party content in general, so scripts and images and everything else that's loaded from a third-party website. And uh, the question, uh, maybe uh, um, just out of personal interest, is which side have you found that has the most obnoxious, loudest, and just longest sound created by that add-on? Um, well, I'll start with the second question first. So when I was developing it, uh, one of the websites that was uh, crashing the browser was Vogue, actually. Okay. Um, and I mean, for the first question, I, just, I mean, it was important for me that it was just a sonification of the data, so not to have a visualization. Yeah. So, sorry, that was badly formulated. I meant the same uh, thing, but with third-party content in general. Uh, so scripts that are loaded from other sites, that these could also have a um, audio representation. Oh, so kind of like the other question, just like yeah. other tracking. Yeah. No, I think it would be great to develop it in that way. Yeah. I'll take a last question for microphone number two. 
Hi. Uh, I noticed that when you scrolled down the website, there was a lot of noise. Yeah. And I don't have much technical background, but uh, I was just wondering why there would be so many uh, cookies loading up when you do such action. Well, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, there's a few websites that do that. That whatif.com one, which is a flight search engine, is one that does. Um, and whether that is because they're tracking your every single move on the page, um, or if it's just um, sometimes with some, which it probably is, I would say, because I think I imagine they would generate a lot of their revenue from data and selling data. Um, but sometimes you get websites like, say, um, um, Deutsche Bahn, and that also has this constant cookie. And I don't think, I mean, like I said, again, I can only speculate. I don't think it's necessarily because they're um, collecting so much data on you because I assume they're making money by selling tickets. But sometimes it's a kind of, I suppose, not as someone who's a programmer, but a clumsy way of um, designing your sort of back-end infrastructure. Because cookies aren't just used for tracking. Like, um, they are a state mechanism. So, uh, yeah, I can't answer that. I actually can't answer that question because I can't tell. Even if I, like, look back at this um, background page, which is as much information as I can get for what cookies are happening when I scroll, it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so that's all the time we have. Thanks again okay. to Jasmine for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.